I wonder if you can remember a time when you were tiny and everything had gone wrong. And you were just there, desolate and in tears. And it felt like the world was falling in. And then somebody that you loved, some trusted, came and put their arms around you and said, there, there, it's going to be okay. It's a really amazing experience. Maybe you've done it to someone recently. To simply say, they're there. It's going to be okay. Because, of course, in the midst of when it feels like everything's gone wrong, we can't see beyond it. And to have somebody that we trust, somebody who knows better, who can see further than us to say, listen, you know, it is actually going to be okay, is a profound thing. And in this passage... God is saying those words to you. They're there. It is going to be okay. Hope often seems in short supply in our world. Life can come crashing in. Things can be really very hard. But God says, listen, it is going to be okay. And perhaps you really need to hear that today. And you need to hear it, and not just hear the words, but take it to heart. Believe it. And allow those words from God to just comfort your heart. Whatever is going on, it's going to be okay. Now, of course, if you're a child, you will probably say, yes, but how is it going to be okay? Because that's what we do, isn't it? And um, this is an interesting sort of reflection on perspective and hope and seeing the bigger picture in the midst of our difficulties. How is it going to be okay? Because often it doesn't seem like it's going to be okay at all. But this is what God says. These things shall pass. Even these things shall pass, and all things shall pass. He says people are like grass, and the wind blows over it, and its place will know it no more. It's interesting that the context of this passage, Isaiah 40, it's a sort of turning point in the book of Isaiah. And it's at a time and a place where the world seems to be falling to pieces, the The people of God are ruled over by corrupt and hapless leaders. And um, uh, it feels like everybody's turned the wrong direction and turned their back on God and everything's just gone wrong. But into that, the word of God comes and says, even this will pass. These bad times will come to an end. Evil regimes do crumble. Tyrants fall, often dramatically. You see, the thing is, we want problems solved quickly. But the wisdom of God is that quick fixes very rarely make things better and very often makes things worse. And Advent is a time for remembering that the purposes of God are long. He takes a long view. He's playing the long game. And these things will pass. In the midst of whatever you're going through, in the midst of a crisis, it feels like this is going to last forever. We can't see beyond it. But if we're unable to raise our sights, set our heart on God and his purposes, then we can look to the future with hope. Because there is one thing that is certain, and that is that God and his word never fail. Verse 8 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. It usually feels like the world is hurtling on in its own direction, jumping from one thing to another, one crisis to the next, with all of the noise and competing voices. But for the people of God, experience teaches us that few of these things ultimately come to anything. 
And that by contrast, God's promises do not fail. Advent teaches us to look back to the things that God has done. Scripture is full of that thing. Remember what God has done in the past. Remember what he's done in history. Remember what he's done in your life. And allow that to help you to trust him for the future. The word of the Lord is sure. It is a rock upon which we build our lives, which can weather the inevitable storms that come. Remember that God has been faithful to you in the past and believe that he will continue to be the same because God does not change. Remember the good things that he has done. Trust that he will be faithful in the future. Now, often it seems like it's uh, a long wait. It takes a long time for God's purposes to be fulfilled. And I haven't really got any consolation for you there because, well, yes, that seems to be how it works. Um, The reading we had was written about 700 years before the events of which it spoke about 700 years before John the Baptist, who was obviously the figure that was promised there. So it seems like that's the sort of time scale which isn't a big deal to God. And so we probably need to come to terms with the fact that the sort of the scope of our lives is only a sort of a, a, a short period of time for God. What's the, the word that the New Testament uses, the phrase that um, a thousand years is like a day to God? And so we're going to have to slightly come to terms with the fact that God's perspectives and purposes are worked out over much bigger timescales than our lifetimes. And we need to sort of recognize that we get to play a part, but it's quite a small part. It's an enormous privilege, but we don't often get to see the end of the story. We have to learn to trust, to to find that thing which is a sure foundation which is God and his promises and his word and build our lives upon that and then build for the long term to raise our eyes above our sort of fleeting troubles and set our hearts on that which is eternal because the truth is that God is greater than all our fears verse 28 have you not known Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. God is incomprehensible in his vastness, in his greatness. The fact that we can comprehend him at all is frankly miraculous. Human beings are infinitesimally small in comparison. And yet, in the Christmas story, We speak of a God who makes himself known to us. Never take that for granted. His purposes are greater than we can begin to imagine, and yet he makes them known to us. As the children's song says, our God is a great big God, but he holds us in his hands. Isn't that lovely? And our reading finished with some words which uh, warm my heart every time I'm feeling like tired or worn out or not great. It says this, verse 31. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. And on a difficult day, I treasure those pictures When I'm weary and heavy laden, what do I do? I seek the Lord. I wait on him. And that has to be sort of deliberate and active. It's not something that's just going to happen. I raise my eyes to his purposes beyond the immediacy of my troubles. I practice putting my trust in him and his purpose. So hold on hope. Hold on hope this advent and i mean that deliberately not passively i don't mean well that's a nice idea i'll try and remember that i mean actually put your trust in the god who is working his purposes out the god who is vast beyond comprehension and yet holds you in his hands hear these words do you not know have you not heard 
The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fail. But those who put their trust in the Lord will rise up and soar like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This Advent, hold on hope. Put your trust in God, despite how things seem. Look to him, and he will sustain you and renew your strength. And even as you walk this weary road, you will do so with a sense of hope and joy in your heart as we sing songs of hope to our faithful God. Amen.